Jesus, we love you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst. God, we thank you for these children. God, we thank you for children's church. God, everything that's happening up there. And Lord, that we get to be a place that creates space for people to experience your presence and you, Jesus. And God, we pray that, uh, again, that all the children are part of Oak City. God, that they would follow you all the days of their life. God, we pray that they would be protected, Lord. We pray that they're, um, Lord, I pray that they would, they would be so experience your presence that, that, Father, they would never be able to walk away from it. God, I pray for that. And even when they do, Lord, their hearts, if they ever, if they ever do, God, that their hearts would be turned back to you because of what you've done in their lives. And so we just bless the kids in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Word today. I do have something I want to share with you. Um, <clears throat> I uh, and, and this I really probably hit a lot of it earlier, uh, but I feel like there is something that God is doing prophetically in our environment, and I feel and I want to I want to speak today more from the heart and more what what I believe that God is doing in our midst, um, and I, I think it's it's, it's pretty kind of self evident, uh, but I believe that that God is inviting us into a place of freedom in His presence. I believe God's inviting us into a place uh, to explore and <clears throat> to be empowered in the things of God. I believe that God um, wants to, I don't know how to say this other than to set us more free. <laughs> like, I, I believe that we're free. I believe, I mean, I believe in, in a lot of ways we are free, but I believe that God wants to set us free. And I believe that the uh, world needs a free church. Like, we need a free church. The world needs a free church. We, and, and I, I just get this, this sense of God inviting us into this place of, of it even being messy and being okay with mess. Um, I, I'll, I'll share a little bit about how I, I got there. Not, I have been seeing for quite a while 11-11. And 11-11 for me, so I'd see it on the clock. I even just showed fair, even at, just a minute ago, I, I saw 11-11. I probably have, I don't know, maybe... 30 to 40, I should go count them, pictures of 1111 on my phone. And it was interesting. I was sitting in my one of my spots in, uh, at Starbucks this past week, and I was literally typing this out. And the lady uh, that was at the um, drive through window, she says, that'll be 1111, sir. And I've just seen, I've been seeing 1111 everywhere. And 11, again, 1111 for me has meant transition. And even as as we know, we're we're moving into a new property, and that was a long process for us. I mean, that took you know over a year in time to uh, see this come to fruition. And during that time, there was many times where it didn't look like it was going to work out. But I would continually see eleven eleven, and I knew that God was transitioning us. And I obviously knew that it was a physical transition. Um, but I remember a few weeks ago when Danny was here. I sat, we sat down, he did two days with our team of training, and when I sat down right before Danny started, I just felt it in my heart. I was like, wow, we, we're, we're in a transition. Like even as a team, like I just feel like there's, God is transitioning us right now. And I even shared that with the team before we started. I was like, you know what? I feel like there's something happening in our environment where we're going to look different. We're going to feel different. Even our team and the way that we operate, like we're just going to feel different. God's bringing us into a transition. And then Laurie Ann and Rainer came last week, a uh, team from Bethel Church, and they prophesied this. And she has a real prophetic grace on her life, and she just prophesied. She's like, I, I feel like this transition, I think it, actually that might have been Rainer that said this, that I feel like this transition is not just a physical transition, but it's a spiritual transition. And, and I, I really just sense that in, in who we are, that God is transitioning us. And I'll say it this way, this is even a word that Rainer gave me, that God is lowering the bar. <laughs> that, you know, often we say God's raising the bar. But I, I, I sense in this season that God is lowering the bar for us. And what that means for me is it's less about other things and more about Him. There's less that I'm focused on. Even in my own life this past week, I just spent more time in His presence. I spent more time with Him. And I feel that God is inviting us into this place where He's actually lowering the bar. He's lowering the expectation. And He's, he's realigning us with the one thing that really matters, which is His presence. Like, I know God's always focusing on His presence. Like he, I mean, I feel like there's always a theme at Oak City. It's who we are. We're about experiencing more of God. But I do think in, in seasons, God will really highlight things. 
And I feel like in this season that God is highlighting His presence and really freedom in His presence. I, uh, a few weeks ago, or actually I think about a week and a half ago, I was spending some time with God and the Holy Spirit told me to read my Bible. <laughs> I felt this. I just felt, I was sitting there spending time with him, and I felt him say, read your Bible. And, and I, I knew that this, you know, as, as a pastor, you know, you're preparing sermons. I, I'm, I'm in the Bible, you know, quite a bit. But I, I knew that it was more about being in the Bible to know the author, to know his ways, to know his practices. I knew that it wasn't as much for me. It wasn't as much, I'm not trying to preach a sermon, but I'm actually in the Word of God so that I can know the author. How many of you know that the Bible is a lot bigger on the inside than it is on the outside? The kingdom is a lot bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. I think early in my, my walk with God, I would, I would view God, I would probably say, I would say it like this. I don't know that I would have put words like this on it way back when, but I would have viewed God as my elementary principle. You remember the elementary principle? Back when they still had the paddle. Back when the principal could still paddle you, you know, I know that would be like whatever, whatever it'd be today. <laughs> but back then, they still could paddle you. And I remember you never wanted to go to the principal's office because he was the ultimate, you know, the principal to me represented the ultimate protector of the rules and the ultimate enforcer of the rules. Like, this is how I saw the principal. It's like, you know, if you, if you did something to such a degree that I had to go see the principal, like, you knew you were really in trouble. And the principal was the guy with the paddle. He was the guy that, man, if you really break the rules and you break them enough, then you're going to have to go meet the principal. And, and I, I want to say that I think our framework of who God is to us, it will affect how we read the Bible. Our framework, it'll actually affect how we live our life. Who God is to us is, is who God will be through us. And so understanding who God is in my life is so important because it determines how I live my life. It determines how I approach the Bible. And, you know, with this principle, elementary principle perspective of who God is, what happens is, is we, we, live, we can live our lives with don'ts and shoulds. Like when I, when I looked at the Bible, I would think of the Bible as a list. And I, I don't think, again, I don't think I would have put words on it like this. But I, I looked at the Bible as a list of don'ts and a list of shoulds. It was a list of don'ts. You know, especially when you're younger, it's like, you know, don't drink alcohol, don't do drugs, don't have premarital sex, like there's, don't look at porn, like there's this huge list of things that you, sh you should not do. And then it, had, then it felt like this list of things that I should do. You know, I should go to church, I should behave, I should act right. And I do feel like God is setting us free from shoulds. I, gotta, I feel like, you know, if, if, you're, if we're in this place where I'm doing things because I should, then I'm not doing it from a powerful choice. I'm just being drug around by the cultural Christianity way of doing things. And the problem is, is I end up being places that I really don't even know if I really want to be there. But when you make a powerful choice, because the thing is, is that you have been set free. And that when I make a powerful choice to come to church, then not only am I there because I should be, but I'm there because I'm choosing to be. And that gives me responsibility. It gives me ownership. And so I, I feel like there's some shoulds that God's breaking off as well. I'm sure none of y'all feel that. Never had any shoulds. Um, the don'ts in the Bible, there are some don'ts, and, and Paul has some really good list of them. You can go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. There's some, because there are things, like, I mean, there, there are things, sin, unhealthy behavior, that are destructive. There are things that um, they hurt you and they hurt the people around you. And there are things that, and ultimately, those things lead us to bondage. And so there are things, like in the Bible, that Paul, and he's pretty clear about them. You can go find some really good list of things that are, hey, these things, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. These things are not the behavior, are not the practices, or the ways of the kingdom. And then he shows us what are those ways. But I want to say it like this, that overall, as I read through the Bible and I look at the life of Jesus, it is overwhelmingly empowering. It's overwhelmingly, like this book is a whole lot bigger on the, it's amazing what God empowers us to do. It's amazing how much he sets us free and empowers us. You know, Jesus took 12 guys 
and he didn't turn them into 12 guys, nice guys that follow the rules. I mean, think about this. At one point, the disciples, think if you walked into church and me and Pharaoh were arguing about who's the greatest. You'd probably turn around and walk out. Like if me and Pharaoh were up here like, hey, actually, Pharaoh, I'm greater than you. Just a couple weeks ago, prayed for a guy, had metal in his body. God dissolved it, which obviously means that I'm better than you. It's like, obviously, I'm greater than you. Like, there's something on my life that I'm... And, I mean, this is, the, this is Peter, James, and John. This is the conversation that they're having. They're over there sitting there saying, well, I drove a demon out. I raised some guy. Look, Peter's over there. Look, my shadow actually heals people. Eat that, Paul. You know, it's like, look, look, at, look at me. Um, look, at, look at this guy over here. Paul's like, yeah. So, I mean, you can just imagine, like, this is the kind of conversation that they, they are following King Jesus. So they're following the one that we're following. And Jesus created an environment for them where they felt free, where it was okay with mess. And God did, he did correct them along the way. He did say, hey, look, guys, I know you're arguing about who's the greatest, but I want to show you how to be great. I'm actually going to show you here's, how you, here's how you become great. You actually become like a child. You actually become like a servant. You actually serve others, and you get on your knees, and you get the towel out, and you wipe other people's feet. Like that is actually greatness in the kingdom. But he, he, Jesus created this environment where these 12 fishermen, 12 like ordinary people, turned into people that turned the world upside down. And they weren't just a bunch of nice Christian guys. These were guys that were in, empowered with the Holy Spirit. They were not perfect. I mean, you think about it. You get to the end of Jesus' discipleship program. <laughs> three years are up, and Peter denies him three times. You know, I mean, they, 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 these guys were, this was not like the perfect bunch. And, and these are the guys, but Jesus empowered them. Think about this for a minute. He empowered Judas, like one of his 12. One of his 12. I've heard it said like this, and I like this, that if, if we create environments where we keep Judas's from happening, then we'll also keep Peter's from happening. If we keep environments where, where, where if we're trying to, protect everything and make it all clean and perfect and neat and comfortable and all of that. You know what? Peter, James, and John and the rest of the guys are not going to be powerful in that environment. Like they, he, Jesus was okay. Like, and even, you know, you think about it, you're like, Jesus probably should have picked somebody else to run the money. I mean, this is the guy that handled the money and, and he empowered these 12 guys. You know, I, I said this earlier, but you know, it was like the Holy Spirit, Jesus told his disciples, he said, hey, I want you to go wait. Don't do anything else. I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. And you shall receive limitations. You shall receive the 12 rules. You, should, you know, Jesus didn't give his disciples, the, you know, the rules. He gave them the kingdom. He said, like, yes, are there, there are rules? Are there some don'ts? Yes, Absolutely. But he empowered these guys, and he said, The Holy Spirit shall come on you, and you shall receive power. I mean, just think about that. Like, you receive, like, you're getting the nuclear bomb of God. <laughs> you're receiving power from God. And this, this is, like, for me, there, there's been this, as I've, I've, I've read through the Scriptures, I see how Jesus empowered His twelve. He set them free, He equipped them, and He empowered them. And I think the, the, the message, the theme that I'm, I'm, I'm going after a little bit today is, is that I think God wants to give us freedom and he wants, to give us, he wants to empower us to explore the things of God. Because if I'm looking at the Scripture through the principle mindset, then I'm thinking through this lens. I'm thinking, what do I need to do just enough to get into heaven? And what do I not need to do so that I still get into heaven? <laughs> Like that's the mindset that we live in because it's like I'm, I'm thinking through a rules-based reality and I'm thinking, okay, I can do just enough to get in. Or, and I'm thinking, okay, what don't I need to do that's going to keep me out? And it's like that, that is not the type of relationship that God is inviting us into. He's saying, hey, come follow me and I'm going to pull the things that I've put inside of your heart and I'm going to empower you with the kingdom of God. I'm going to give you purpose. I think about the fruits of the Spirit. It's like he, he doesn't say, you know, this is the fruit of the Spirit. You know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. He's like, the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness. And it's even, this one boggles my mind some, it's self-control. It's not even God control. The fruit of the Spirit is actually, I'm going to give you control of yourself. 
where you're not controlled by exterior things, but you're actually controlled by the Spirit of God that lives inside of you and that you are powerfully able to make good decisions. It's self-control. And it even says that there's not a law for those things. It's like pretty much there's no boundary. Like you can love as much as you want to love. Like obviously we know things can be unhealthy and things can be outside of God. But it's like there is no, there's no law against love, against joy. There's no boundary. It's like he is empowering us to radically love and live in the joy, patience, goodness of God. <clears throat> I, uh, you know, Apple... Yeah, you know, your iPhone here. You know, Apple didn't didn't create a new phone, invent a new phone because they were worrying about trying to follow the rules. They created a new phone because they lived in a place that was creative. They were willing to explore. They were willing to go after new things. Now, if you're living in the manufacturing department, then you want to follow the rules. <laughs> you know, you don't want to create a car and you're not making sure that the car works right, you know? But I, I sense that, that God for us, it's like we're living in the research and development department. And that there's room to take risk. There's room to explore. There's room to get things wrong sometimes. Yes, do we need to have a humble heart and, and be able to take feedback and learn and understand maybe like, okay, I tried that and maybe that wasn't a good thing. And that I'm able to take that feedback. But we need to have freedom because we're not, you're not going to become fully who you are unless you're free. You're not going to be fully empowered unless you're free. You're not going to be, like, if I'm still holding on to the fear of man, if I'm holding on to things that aren't God, holding on even to past trauma and things like that, and I'm not actually stepping into a complete free place, and how many of you know that you can only find freedom in Christ? Everything else is, is counterfeit or it's an illusion, but true freedom comes in Him, and God actually wants to set us free. And I, I feel like in this season right now, Part of that freedom is our times together where we're worshiping and we're in the presence of God. And I feel like it's just going to be a wild, free, good place. And God wants us to step into that freedom. Something powerful happens when we get free. <clears throat> For the sake of time, I, uh, I'm going to jump. I've got some things that I think uh, just define a free culture. I think i got six things here that I think just, and I'll run through these real quick. Things that define a free culture. True freedom can only be found in Jesus. For freedom, there's, a, there's context to this in Galatians, but he says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. And a lot of that's talking about the law and some of that stuff as well. Romans 8, 1 through 2, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Look, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Free cultures create space for God to move. I love this too. And do not apologize about it. Free cultures create space for God to move. I love, there's a scripture in Thessalonians that says, do not quench the Spirit. That word means stifle or extinguish, but do not quench the Spirit. I think our heart, our heart for, and I, I, I mean it's always our heart, but I feel like God's really highlighting this in this season. I think at times it can look different, but I think there's something about just giving space for God to move. And I just encourage you in your own life, Whatever this looks like, maybe it's spending some more time with Him in prayer. Maybe you, you, you feel that little, the word or unction from God to go do something or spend a little extra time reading the Bible or whatever it is. I, I just want to encourage you to, to spend time with God, to create space in your life for God to move. And I believe He's going to meet you there in a powerful way. Free cultures are okay with things not being perfect and polished and are okay with messy. That's hard for us. That can be hard for us, I think, in the environment, culture that we grow up in. Free cultures are okay with things not being perfect and polished and are okay with messy. I, I mentioned this, that in Acts chapter 2, or I, don't, I think I might have mentioned this earlier, but it says on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the, the people that were walking by in Acts chapter 2, verse 12, it says, it says they were amazed and perplexed. 
They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. <laughs> so think about this. This is, this is God moving. This is the Spirit of God moving. And the people that are walking by, this is the, the observation that they have. One, it says they're amazed and perplexed. That, that word there means that they were displaced. They were moved to a different place. It was almost like I'm heading, I'm doing my familiar thing. I'm doing what I know that I, I should do. And then all of a sudden, I run into God. And it's like, wow, I'm amazed and I'm perplexed. And even some of them, it says, you know, as you go on, 3,000 people got saved that day. But it also says that some of them made fun of them. Like this was the environment that, that God, when He poured out His Spirit, this is what was happening. And, and I think sometimes we have to be okay that people may not understand what we're doing. You know, there's a, there's a difference, and I'm actually, this is my next one, is that there's a difference between a safe place and a comfortable place. You know, a safe place, I think Jesus created a safe place for His disciples to be authentic, to argue about who's the greatest. He obviously coached them and, and trained them in the way to go. But He created a place where they could be themselves. They could be authentically who they are. Like, yes, out of that, they became these world changers. They became people that, I mean, uh, they wrote a lot of the Bible. You know, they became people that were, were followers of Jesus, that laid down lovers of who God is. But Jesus created this, this place that was safe, but I promise it wasn't comfortable. <laughs> there was many times, I mean, Jesus walking on water, they thought it was a ghost. I mean, there was so, so many different, so many opportunities where it was like, we are not in comfortable place. Our ship is about to wreck. We're about to die, and Jesus is asleep. You know, like there's so many moments where, I mean, there's so, it was not this, they did not, Jesus did not bubble wrap them. Because I think what happens is when we bubble wrap people, we end up creating bubble wrap people. <laughs> Instead of people that can actually walk in power and empowered to walk in freedom. So, come on. Free cultures build and empower big people. Free cultures build and empower big people. The last thing I'll leave you with is freedom requires love and responsibility. It really does. You, to have a true free culture, to be a free person, it actually takes responsibility. In 1 Peter 2, 16, it says, Live as people who are free. Come on. Let this just be our verse. Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Live as people who are free. In Galatians 5, 13, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Through love serve one another. See, you're free, and we also have responsibility. If you're able, can you stand with me? <clears throat> I believe God's inviting us. I'm going to have the team come back up. We're just going to sing one more song. I'm going to have our prayer servants come up as well. I, I believe with, with all my heart that God is inviting us into a place where He is moving. A place of freedom. A place where we feel free and we also feel empowered by God. God, I just I, I pray this over Oak City. I pray that, that world changers would come out of this environment. God, I pray people that are free and empowered with the kingdom of God. Lord, we, 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 want, we want the purity and we want the power. We all know that that's, we, we want character and we want to walk and demonstrate the kingdom of God. We want to be healthy and whole people, Father. And God, I pray over us. I pray that our times together, Lord, that freedom would reign. That freedom would reign. Lord, let freedom reign in this place. We know where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. I think my, my one just encouragement, my thing you take away with you is, what would you look like if you were just completely free? What would you look like if you were completely free and fully alive in God? 
God, I pray that those are the people that we would become. 